The solution number one is whenever I raise, I just always have it. So the, the problem number one was whenever I raised, I always had a good hand. So my opponent can just fold the line and get it. So the, the solution is also raise up hands as bluffs. But these should not be the hands barely worse than my nines and ace queen. So the hands like pocket eights, ace jack suited, the hands that I said I would call. I don't want to be bluffing with these hands because these hands are good, right? Raising them and folding them to a small end is a waste when I can just call and see a pop. I'd much rather raise hands even worse than these as my gloves because it's less of a waste to fold to his all. So it sort of goes, the best hands I raise and go all in three more. The next best hands I call and they're good enough to call and see a pop. And then the hands below that I would raise as a bluff, basically. I would raise and fold to his all in and not cry if he goes all in because my hand wasn't that good to start with. And the complete trash hands, like 7 2 off screen, I would just fold. So, right, so this is sort of the paradigm. Um, this, this is what I just talked about. The best hands you raise and call and all in. The next best hands you call, the hands below that, you would raise and fold to an all in. And notice that. The hands that I play at all is still only a very small percentage, right? It, I, I still fold like 80% of the hands, even more. I, I still fold like 85% of hands. But the top 15% of hands is sort of split into the very top I raise and get it all in, the next I call, and the next I raise as a block and fold through it all. And then, but this, but even when I split this into three classes, it's only the top 15% of hands that I'm splitting. Everything else, 85% of hands are still full, right? So we've seen lots of paradigms similar to this before, right? We've seen lots of paradigms similar to this before, where it's I bet I raise my good hands, I raise my bad hands, and I call my medium hands, right? So this is basically called polarization, right? I talked about this before. When I talked about post flop play last class, I said raise your good hands, call your medium strength hands. Raise your speculative hands, your less good hands that are still good, like flush draws and straight draws, and fold everything else, right? And it's also like the fundamental theorem of poker that I talked about earlier, where I said, bet for value when you have a good hand, bet as a bluff when you have a weak hand, and don't bet when you have a medium strength hand, right? So the, the paradigm is sort of the same in all these different situations I'm talking about. It's basically, this is like the idea of poker, right? So I just wanted to compare, I just wanted to compare this bullet with this bullet with with, what I, with this paradigm, right? So the idea is basically, we have a very easy decision if he goes all in. Because whenever we raise, we either have a really good hand or a hand not that good, right? If we did raise with a hand in this range, like pocket eights or ace jack suited, we would be put at a tough decision when he went all in. We wouldn't be able to decide whether we should go all in or fold. So the idea is we're basically making life easy for ourselves with this paradigm of, Raise the best, then call, then raise as a bluff, and then pull the videos. Sorry, okay, so solution two is, sorry, so the second problem was, whenever I call, I can never have a monster hand, that's what I said. I, I can never have a really good hand. So the people behind, like the big blind, right, they can just re-raise all in, and I, I would usually have to fold. Right, so the solution is basically, there is no really great solution. Like, occasionally you can try to call here with a hand like queens, so that, right, so let me just go look at the situation again. The situation was this, right? So I said, if I call into the situation, I never have a good hand. So these guys, nor the, the button, the small one, the big one, can just re-raise and guarantee that I'll fold because I can't have a great hand. Right, that was the problem. But this, yeah, and there basically is no great solution. So. You can occasionally do this with like pocket queens or whatever, a good hand, and you can do this so that you do sometimes have a good hand when you call, but overall it's going to suck when you call with pocket queens and your opponent had pocket jacks and the flop comes ace hop, and like then you don't get much money out of him, whereas if you raised, he would have went all in and you would have called and he would have won all his money. So it doesn't really matter that much, problem two, if the people behind you aren't going to take advantage of you by re raising. So. Yeah, so this is basically a problem whenever you decide to just call preflop instead of raising. Because when you just call a raise preflop instead of raising, you basically announce 
I do not have pocket aces, I do not have pocket kings to the people behind you and they're going to be like, oh, okay, I'm just going to raise and I know you're going to fold. Like, this is a problem in general with calling pre -bop. And the only solution is basically sometimes you've got to call pocket aces there to trick them. But in general, it's not going to be a problem if they're not going to take advantage of it. Anyways, the result was kind of crazy. The result was my opponent went along with Queen Jack and I called it. Luckily, uh, he, uh, I won the hand I was supposed to win 60% of the time. So, so that was a that was another advantage of raising. I, I got him to do something stupid, right? I got him to gamble and four bet all in with only Queen Jack offsuit. Okay, so a few hands later, basically the same situation. I'm just going to go quickly. It's a very similar situation, right? The raiser's position is basically the same. In the last case, the raiser was high jack minus one, four from the button. Now the raiser is five from the button. And the effective stack size is still basically the same. So the range of hands I do this with is still the same. And I, I, I am doing this in five and tens. Right, so, so the same thing. My play is basically the same. I three bet call, pocket nines plus, ace queen plus. I just call, pocket sevens, pocket eights, and ace jack suited. And a three bet fold with a few other hands, ace jack off suited, king queens. So the result was bad for us this time. He went along with pocket jacks, we called, and we lost. That's okay, we still had, we still have 11,000 chips. Okay, now, we lose a bunch of chips because we don't get a good hand for a lot, which is fine. So we're down to 9,000, and then, we get pocket kings, and this happens. So this guy who is high jack minus one, four from the button, he just calls, and this guy, touch my nuts, raises from the button. <laughs> <laughs> raises from the button. Okay, so. Right, so with, with pocket kings, we're obviously going to go all in, but that's not the important question, right? The important question is what's the range of hands? So, once again, it's all under a fold, and I'd say in this situation, it's about pocket eights are better, ace jack suited are better. So, yeah, so I'm not going to include king queen offsuit here, so it's a bit tighter than, than before. <laughs> so, the limp changes things a lot. So, the limp, right, remember what that meant? The limp meant calling when the pot wasn't raised yet, usually a derogatory term, because it's usually not a good play. Um, so this changes a lot because the pre-flop raiser is opening a lot less when there is a limp on it. If there was, sorry, if there was no limp, if this guy did not call and this guy just raised 1500, I'd go on with a lot more hands. I, I would probably add hands like pocket sixes, pocket sevens, ace jack offsuit, king queen to my range. So anyways, the result was he called with ace jack suited. I think it's borderline. I think it's fine. I think his equity is around zero. Not negative, not positive, not And we do win. Okay, next hand. Next hand, the cutoff is I have pocket nines. And I agree with yeah. Um, in the previous hand, mm -hmm. um, if someone actually just called, is it possible that you know that if you just call, there will be someone raising them? And then in that case, if he has enough in hand, he can re raise that. Is that yeah. possible? Yeah, that, that is possible. So this ABT707, if he has like pocket aces, this is a deep, oh, this is a reasonable play if he knows that when he just calls, someone will raise it. That is reasonable. But in general, like this assumption is a bit off because people aren't just gonna raise you for sure. And like the thing is, you need such a good thing to do it with, right? So basically, like, even if you get raised, like if you re-raise, you're basically giving away the fact that you have aces because you never really want to do this with a hand not aces, right? So it's just hard to play balanced when you do this. Like, yeah, I mean, sure, occasionally you'll get paid off when you do this with pocket aces when someone raises you. But I mean, like, you're basically giving away that you have pocket aces anyway. Because, like, you wouldn't do this with ace king, right? Because you don't want to give the small blind, you don't want to give the big blind a chance to see the pot for free with 7 2 offsuit if you have ace king, because your chances of losing to any two cards is so. What about if he raises and then just call and then pretend that you have a you can just slow play or aces because that will give you a higher I guess that will give you a higher five dollars because other people wouldn't know that you have a couple of X. And then if you see a good flop, then you probably can be involved in it. 
Yeah, okay, yeah. What you're suggesting is reasonable if your opponent likes to bet and likes to bluff. But, I mean, there's also the situation where, like, say your opponent had pocket jacks, right? If he might just raise and you call, and the flop might just come, like, queen three, and he might just check and never bet again. Whereas if you just raise in the first place and he re-raised, you can go along and you would have called, and you would have won on his money, right? So, so if you have a really good hand and your opponent likes blocking, then yeah, just by only checking and calling, you can get into good and bad play. But for every opponent like that, there's also opponents who never like betting, but will call you a lot, in which case you're losing a lot by not betting with your good hands, right? So yeah, so it is a trade-off, but it, like just theoretically in general, just calling you the flop bases isn't a good idea for the reasons I have. Yeah. So can you go over again why this range of hands is smaller than the deeper? Right. Um, because he needs to be scared of the lumber. So like, if there was no lumber, he can try to steal the blinds with a wider range. Because stealing the blinds is easier, right? He only needs both blinds to fold. But when there is a lumber, to steal the blinds successfully, he also needs the lumber. So he's not going to steal as much. Yeah. Okay, so we do win, and that's a nice double up. So the next hand, a lot later position now. Cut off raises, and we have pocket nine. So we do re-raise, but once again, uh, so this whole tournament, I happen to have very good hands in every situation. But <laughs> that's how good I um, So okay, so let's talk about uh, what my range is. So notice now, my range is a lot wider. Okay, so the first thing is, I'm calling his all in whenever I re raise, because I've already put a decent percent of the effective stack, right? The effective stack is only, is only 12,000, because that's what he has. And my range here is maybe like ace 7 suited, ace 9 offsuit, <coughs> king, king 10 suited, king jack offsuit, queen jack suited, 5, 5 plus. So notice it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a ton wider than before. And the reason is because my hand's position is a lot later, right? So I expect him to be stealing a lot more. Like in the last situations where I had the pocket tens, my opponent was all the way over here. Like he, uh, he's not going to be stealing that much because he has to go through all these people. But here, my opponent only has to go through three people. So I can make this basically, I can go along with a lot weaker of a hand and be profitable because he's just going to have trash such a large percentage of the time. Anyway, so I get lucky this hand. He goes all in, then I do call. And I get very lucky <laughs> after that flop where he even has the third drop. Okay, so we have a lot of chips now. And, okay, so once again, I, yeah, so I get far in this tournament. I'm showing this tournament because I get far. And to get far, I have to always happen to have a good hand. But the important thing is, what is my range, right? I mean, I could have given a tournament where I didn't have any aces in all these situations, and I had a seven, and I still called it, but then I would have probably lost, and I wouldn't. So, anyways, so I'll save my ranges. So here, I raise aces from the button, and the small blind goes all in for about twelve and a half big blinds. So the hands that I think I can probably call with is about this: ace five suited or better, ace seven off suited or better, king nine suited or better, king ten off or better. So the, the point is, notice that this is a very large percentage of hands. And the reason is because he knows that I'm going to try to steal the blinds very frequently, right? He knows that because I'm from the button and I only have to go through two people. So he knows that he's going to go all in a lot. And I'm, I know this because I know that he knows that I'm going to raise a lot. So I can call a lot because I expect him to be, to be making this bluff very frequently. So, so this is my range. And once again, I'm just trying to give you lots of data points so that to help you extrapolate. So the result was he had a six, which I think is a fine play by him, because he only had 12 big points. I think if he had like 15 big points here, it's risking too much, or like say like 17 is risking too much. But he wasn't risking that much. He only he had less than 12 and a half big points. So I think his play is fine. Okay, next hand. This guy, who's under the gun, but notice that there's a seat missing, so he's actually under the gun plus one, because he's only six from the button. Goes all in for about eight big points. I have ace king, I obviously call. Um, so yeah, I, I happen to have a good hand, but okay, but let's actually figure out what my range of calling is. So I expect his range to be something like this, about 20%. So when he's 
in this position, he goes on for eight big blinds. I expect him to do it with approximately these seven hands. Um, something like this. So, checkpoint, are you really going on this frequent, or frequently enough? I expect you to honor. Um, yeah, sorry. I have a question. How did the fact that there are people behind you much more like, affect the decision to just call rather than the way you look at So, oh, this hand. Yeah. Um, so, in general here, in general, it's better to just call, right? Because if I go all in, I'm telling my opponent that I'm putting all my chips in. I'm giving him the information first. But if I just call Aussie Star, let's say, he has to go all in without knowing whether I'm going to go all in or not, right? And then I can fold if I don't have a great hand and go all in if I do have a good hand. I think so, yeah. I mean, ace-king I think is good enough. I think ace-queen is maybe questionable. Ace-jack is definitely a fold. So if Aussie star goes along here, I'm definitely calling with ace-king. Um, with ace-jack, I'm definitely folding. And with ace-queen, it would be it would be a questionable. <coughs> and like with pocket tens, I'm probably calling. Pocket nines, I'm probably folding, yeah. Pocket nines, I might call too, but yeah. So. So my range, so if you do the math, if you do the math, how well I do against this range of his, the positive expectation hands are something like this, ace 10 suited, ace jack off, pocket sixes plus. So notice that I didn't include king queen. So the reason is because I expect my opponent to have a lot of hands that have an ace in a random card, and like king queen doesn't do so well against these hands. So, and also, when I said this was my calling range, I didn't include some hands that was positive expectation to call against his range just because there's players behind, right? So even if I'm barely positive expectation to call this, one of these four guys could go could pick up a good hand. So that's what you were talking about, so that's a very good point. But anyways, I'm still calling most of the time when it's sufficiently positive expectation. Oops. Um, I guess I didn't have the result. But it looks like we won because we have one chance now. So, <laughs> so whatever, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter anyway. I was showing the results for like fun. Okay. Next hand is a hand that I get post spot. So I make it 2345. He makes it 5137. So so the analysis, I basically have three options. I can fold, but my hand is probably too good for this because once again I raised with the button. So he knows that my range is one. So he might not have a great hand when he's making his bluff. <clears throat> Option two is all in. This is good because it might bluff him off a lot of better hands like queen, jack, or whatever. But it's unnecessarily risky when option three is so good. So I'm getting good odds, right? I only have to call 3,000, and there's already like almost 9, yeah, almost 9,000 more pop when you the antis. So I'm getting like three to one odds. And I'm also in position post swap, right, on the button. I also have a hand that plays pretty well post swap because I have a hand that's good enough to go all in when I hit a pair. Because we don't have that many chips left, right? If I call, the pot's going to be 11 and a half, 11 and a half thousand, and there's only 29,000 left to play for. So when I hit a pair, my hand is usually decent, probably good enough to go all in. And I can also make a lot of good all in bluffs along the lines of what I said last class, if I have a straight or a flush drop. So I just want to point out, this play is good with jack-8 suit. <coughs> this play is not good with pocket fours, even though pocket fours is a better hand with raw than jack-8 suit, because it's just so hard to play pocket fours, right? Almost always the one's going to come with three cards higher than four, like queen, nine, six. What are you going to do? You have no idea what to do. Like, your reverse and high odds are terrible. You're just going to make lots of terrible decisions. And it's also terrible with a hand like ace three off, you know, ace three off is a better hand than jack eight three flop because when you hit a three, there's gonna be higher cards you're not gonna know what to do. When you hit an ace, he can have the ace king that he, he was raising, and you're just gonna lose a lot of money. So anyway, so the flop is this, and he bets. So I do get a pair, but I choose not to raise. And the reason is twofold. The jack isn't the highest card, I'm losing to the king, so if I raise, I get, I'm at risk of losing to the king. It's a lot better to raise if it was a jack 9-4 or something, because then I don't lose to just the king. 
And also, a big factor for calling is that I'm not really scared of that many turn cards. Only an ace or a queen as the turn is truly that scary. Compare this to a flop that was king 8 4 instead of king jack 4, then there's a lot more scary cards, right? If it was king 8 4, then any 9 10 jack, queen, or ace will be higher than that pair. But since I paired the jack, it's there's a lot more cards that's here. So I call. So I'm going in the faster because I'm, I'm running a bit behind on top of things. So he checks the turn. No need to bet. Once again, our hand is our hand is really just on the border of being good enough to bet, and there's not that many scary river cards. So, and if we bet, you know, he could have something like pocket queens that he's going to call with. Like when he checks, I, he probably doesn't have a king. But even then, I don't think I'm bad because I don't think he's going to call me with weaker hands that frequently. And I think he will call me with pop, like East Jack and Pocket Queens that do beat me. And there's not that many rivers I'm scared of. So, River, he checks again. I check. I think you could have bet this river for value, which means trying to get him to call with the worst hand. But I choose to bet. I think I choose to check. I think it's very important when you bet, and I do win the pot. Okay, the next hand is pretty simple. I try to seal the wines with the Queen Jack offsuit. I get three bet, rebased by this guy. I just fold. I mean, nothing much you can do here. Queen Jack off is just not good enough, and I would fold. I would call like Queen Jack suited, and I would probably raise something like East Queen and try to get all my money in free flop, and I would call. So the, board, the borderline of the hands I would go all in with is like East Queen, and um, it is a lot of ships. So yeah, I do need a pretty good hand to go all in. So like it's East Queen or Pocket Nines, and I would call with a lot of hands like Queen Jack suited, East Jack off suited, Pocket Sevens. Anyways, I pull. <coughs> in this hand, um, this guy goes all in pre flop, so he has about seven big blinds. I call him Ace Eight suited here, so here I actually don't have a great hand. Ranges. I would expect his range to be pretty wide, something like what I listed here, because you know he's in a pretty good position and he only has seven big blinds, so his risk reward ratio for sealing in blinds is very so I would expect him to have any pair, any ace, any suited king, king seven off suited better, queen five suited better, queen eight off suited better, jack eight suited better, very wide range basically. And my range for calling is about this, ace five suited plus, ace eight off suit plus. So I'm going through it fairly fast, but I'm trying to give you lots of data points for you to see, and you can always go through this after the class. Um, once again, I have to be careful of these two players. So, if you notice something about ranges, so this is an important point, this is sort of theoretical, but if you look at his range, he includes lots of hands like 7-6 suited, 6-5 suited, 5-4 suited, small suited hands, whereas my range is always big cards. So, why is this? So this is theoretically makes sense, right? The person who went all in can have lots of small suited hands, because these hands, like 5-4 suited, while they lose the garbage like queen three off, they still never do that bad against anything, right? So he has lots of hands that are that do similarly well against everything. Usually the bluffer will have hands like that, right? And the person who calls, it makes sense for them to have hands that are usually like a seven offsuit, where you're usually way ahead if he has a six, or like if he has king seven, or you're way behind if he has ace jack or something. So, so notice the way these ranges are constructed. He's got lots of small suited hands, and I've got mostly big cards on my pocket. Anyway, so he has king and queen, but I happen to lose. That's fine. So yeah, so I mean, he didn't actually go all in. There was one bet left, but I mean, we're never going to fold post-flop when pre-flop the pot's already going to be like 30,000 and there's one bet left to play for. So we, we get an all on the turn or something, it doesn't really matter, and I lose. Some hands later, this happens. Cut off raises, I get these seven suited in the small blind and I just go all in. So this is fine, I have less than 20 big blinds. So rule of thumb, this is basically the equity calculation. When you have less than 20 big blinds, a single three raise, a single three bet will usually put you all in. And my range here is pretty wide as you can see because he's in a good stealing position. I expect him to be trying to steal blinds quite frequently. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, jumping on a lot of hands. So any pair, 
piece five suited her better, ace eight off suited her better, king nine suited, king jack off. So as you can see, I'm doing this with a decent amount of hands as a bluff. It looks risky, but he's just folding so frequently because he's going to be trying to steal the blinds very frequently. He can have complete garbage like ten eight off suit, and so I can easily thump on him with all his hands, and he'll usually just fold. Unfortunately, he does call though, but I do get lucky and I do win. <laughs> oh. So that was nice. Okay, so next hand, basically the same thing. This is the very next hand. Once again, someone in late position tries to steal the blinds. I have a pretty good hand. I would be raised just to get, get the fold. And he does fold. That's fine. So once again, my range here is basically the same as my range in the last hand. It's very similar. And yeah. Okay, next hand. We raised 10 8 suited from the cutoff to try to steal the blinds ourselves, but we get caught. The thing is, he has less than 10 big blinds. And if you do the math, it will be a positive expectation, expectation play to call here. So, a rule of thumb is, when the effective stack size is 10 big blinds or less, you usually can't hold you at all in the after you've already raised. Because you've already put in such a high percentage of the effective stack. So, when it's 10 big blinds or less effective stack, when you do the equity calculation, you'll usually find that your odds are good enough to call in almost all situations. So, I do call, so he does have less than 10 big blinds, right? Because 10 big blinds would be 25,000, and he only has 24. Yeah, so, I do call here, and I get lucky again, so I don't know what I have to do to make it far in tournaments. But, yeah, so, so if I knew that he had pocket eights, I wouldn't have called. Like, my odds, so my chances of winning this hand is only 30%. So basically, I need 73 odds or better to call, and I actually don't have that, so I actually made a mistake by calling. But the thing is, I didn't know that he had pocket eights, right? If he had ace-jack, then calling, I would have the odds to call. So, in general, I do have the odds to call, and against his range. Anyways. But yeah, but the point is, 30% is not that bad, right? So, like, 30% is like almost a third of the time, right? Like, it, it's, it's not that bad. The point is, the point is like gambling pre flop is, you need to do it a lot more when you have odds because your odds are just good enough and you're never that bad. Like, 30% is a lot more frequent than you might think. Um, okay. So the next hand, I raise ace-jack offsuit from the from the hijack, and both blinds call. Okay, so the the flop is the flop is pretty good for me, and they both check, which is pretty normal, like I talked about the last class. And I continuation bet very small. So the pot is unfortunately kind of hidden. So the pot is twenty one thousand, right? Eighteen thousand plus three thousand is twenty one thousand. And I only bet like I, I said last class, you should usually bet a third of the, a half the pot. But in this situation, I bet more close to a third of the pot, even less than a third of the pot. So, why is this okay? So, there's basically, there's basically two reasons, or three reasons, I guess. So, there's not many scare cards that come, right? My hand is pretty good. Like, if they have King Jack, they're drawing, they, they can't hit anything big. So, it's okay if I give them good odds by betting small, because my hand is very good and there's not many outs that you can have to hit, right? Compare this to a jack-8-5 flop. If the flop was jack-8-5 instead of ace-8-5, my hand is still good, but a hand like king-queen now has six cards that you can hit to beat, right? But if the flop is ace-8-5, there's the, a hand like king-queen does not have any ways to beat me on the turn. So, yeah. Um, about that, uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. uh, isn't it true that you also have another three outs for your hands? Right, I mean in this case I have another three outs to my jack if I lose. Right, so it's the same situation basically. So in this situation, I'm losing to ace king and ace queen, but I have three outs to hit my jack. In the other situation, I'm losing to pocket queens and pocket kings, but I have three outs to hit my ace. So it's similar situations. The only difference is in this situation, against bad hands like king queen, I'm very safe. But if the flop is a jack 8 5 against even like king 10, they have three outs to the king 8. So usually on ace high boards, 
your hand is pretty safe because no higher cards can be used. So I bet pretty small, right? And also, another factor for betting small is I don't need to try to bet to build a big pot because I can get all their money into the pot even by betting small, right? I can just bet this small and then bet this small again on the turn and bet this small again on the river and the pot will grow exponentially and it'll get all their money in. So unfortunately, they both fold though. Okay, hmm. now this hand. I'm in a small line with queen four suited, and effectively we only have ten big blinds, right? Even though I have fifty big blinds, he only has ten. He only has eleven big blinds, so I'm basically counting this as eleven big blinds because that's the effect of setting sets. And yeah, so we deduce that we can go on with ten eight offsuit here properly. Um, so queen four suited. It's a similar analysis, so this is definitely a profitable play. Result was he folds, which is good. Okay, then the next hand we try to steal. We try to steal from the small line with jack 10 offsuit. So we're too, we're too, we have too many bets to go all in basically. Because we have like 25 bets, right? We basically have 25 big blinds. So I'm not going to risk that much. Like 10 is okay. I'm willing to risk 10 with jack 10 offsuit. 15 is okay. I'm willing to risk 15 with jack 10 offsuit. But this is 25. It's just too much. So I'm just going to be small and see what happens. And he goes all in. So. I mean, yeah, I guess I have to fold, so I guess my steel tech failed. That's okay. What's my calling range against his all-in? Um, ace-5 suited plus, ace-7 offsuit plus. So it's still not that narrow. I'm still willing to go all-in pretty frequently, right? The reason being, he knows that I'm going to steal often because I like to get through one person who steals blinds. And I know that he knows this, so I know that he's probably going to go all-in pretty often. So even at a hand like ace five suited, it's okay to gamble for 25 big blinds when I know he's going to be defending against my steals so frequently. So, yeah, that's about my calling range. A few hands later, I try this again with a much worse hand. Unfortunately, it doesn't look again. Anyways, so okay, that's the end for this class. Next class, I'm going to show more hands. So this is basically... I'm nearing the final couple of tables now. Next class, I'm going to play through every hand of the final table and even talk about hands where I've folded. And it's going to be even more hands and less theory in this class. But I hope you like this actual, let's see, actual hands.